theme for this week is embodied inquiry. It's one of my favorite practices. I find it to be really powerful. Um, uh, it is an advanced practice in the sense that you, you for sure need to have some experience inhabiting the body. It doesn't have to be of much, but you know, have some sort of practice where you can really experience inhabiting the body. That's the embodied part, which we've worked with a lot in this training. Um, so the embodied awareness piece, that has to be, we need to attune to that at least to a certain degree. It does not need to be perfect, so inhabiting the body. Then there's the inquiry side, and I really like how Vince has uh, expressed this in the past in a short way, um, which is using a question as a prompt for discovery. It's really nicely put. So we're doing both at the same time. We're inhabiting the body. So like where there is, if, if there needs to be effort, then there's effort, like I'm gonna inhabit the body maintain that attunement in the body and then prompt with a question. Now I'm going to unpack this more about like, what is this like to practice this way? What might, might we notice? But that's the, the essence of it. So first I want to mention radical curiosity. This is a phrase that I like to use a lot. Um, and this practice naturally cultivates radical curiosity. It's not something that we have to, we're not doing radical curiosity. We're not saying, okay, here's the step for me to do radical curiosity. By doing this practice, you get a taste of that inherently, of what it means to be radically curious. Again, I'm gonna keep unpacking this. Um, but that, uh, that's probably why I love this practice is because it uh, naturally embodies radical curiosity. So saying more about that, we don't have any expectations. This is very important. We're not going in the practice with a question with some end result in mind, per se. We very well might come to this practice with intention and say, oh, it would be really useful for me to work with embodied inquiry. It would be really meaningful for me to work with a particular question. But when we enter into the practice, it's really necessary to let as much of that original intention and expectation go, just inhabiting the body and in and, and asking a question, and then seeing what arises or doesn't arise. We are also not tracking anything. So uh, obviously with embodied inquiry, there's no mention of mindfulness. Now anything might be happening in practice, and as I always encourage, we can be really curious about anything that's happening, but we're not intentionally tracking anything, okay? So we're not looking and saying like, what is arising, what is arising? And we're not also necessarily noting that's arising and that's arising and that's arising. Not doing that. We may take note though, okay? That may very well happen. So we're not shutting anything down, but we're just, I'm differentiating here between other practices. So in a mindfulness practice, we are definitely looking for something usually in some specific way. But here there's a sense of openness. So one of the reasons why this, I, find, I feel it functions so well is because we're bypassing the conceptual mind, but we're not excluding it. I'd say we're, we're bypassing the exclusion, the exclusive use of the conceptual mind, which is often what we do with inquiry. If we just ask us, if we just ask ourselves a question, it can be easy for it to remain up here and we start thinking about it. And that's all that's happening is we're processing a question from up here. When we're inhabiting the body, the mind is still part of our experience. And so, thoughts and images might arise and that's that's great and as we'll see with this kind of practice anything that's arising in this kind of way is really useful and meaningful okay but we're not we're trying not to be condensed and located just in the mind with embodied inquiry we can uh, use embodied inquiry in many domains of our experience. And so I like to use a reference from Ken Wilber's work in integral theory for domains of practice. Um, there's no formal term for this, but I've heard it called uh, the four ups, uh, waking up, cleaning up, growing up and showing up. So we're doing a lot of waking up practice. Uh, some, it, it merges into all these other practices, but waking up's classic, classical awakening, enlightenment, meditation, Buddhism that kind of path. Cleaning up is healing. Usually we're working with things from the past that are carried into the present that continue. 
um, as we've talked about, you know, healing, um, regaining, reclaiming more of our full experience and capacities. Um, growing up is a sense of growing more complex, growing bigger in what we can include and, and process and intake. So our experience feels bigger. I always say it, it's not just that we have a bucket and we fill it up with more things, the bucket gets bigger. You know, that's one way of s simplifying it. Then showing up is how we show up in the world, you know, our responsive presence in the world. So, and that includes enacting in action. So I'm mentioning this because while we'll, we'll be working with embodied inquiry in one way, I really love this practice for all these different domains. I find them really, really useful. And so the most important thing is finding your way honestly to a question um, in, in your own practice. So being on the lookout whenever you're wondering, wondering and you start feeling curious, maybe that can be turned into an embodied inquiry practice. Um, <clears throat> there are two flavors, at least two flavors of questions here. Um, one is an unanswerable question. So we're gonna be working with what is this? today there's a sense of that question there might be responses arising but there's a sense that there's not going to be like a end point and we're just gonna be like, oh yeah this is what it is and now we can get off with the question and leave um it's something we can ask over and over that can enter us into presence and wonder and responsiveness another question that i really like to use where there can be all sorts of responses but we might take and run with the response off the cushion. And that question is, can be framed in a couple different ways. What is needed? Or if I were, when I'm working with somebody privately, I might ask, what do you need? But we're doing it from this embodied inquiry place, place and seeing what arises. That might be meaningful, you know? So one question may lead to something that we follow up with, but there's a sense of being unanswerable and other questions might have a little bit more direction to them off the cushion that deepens our our journey, especially like in healing, I, I find. So anyways, I, I mentioned these two flavors just so to give you a sense of the possibilities of the flavor flavors of questions we might ask. Usually the most important thing is that it's an open-ended question, not a yes or no question. Yeah. So, Oh, oh, and the last thing I want to share in terms of what the question, how the question might be formulated, uh, again, pulling from Ken Wilber's work, the big three, big three perspectives, I, we, and it. So we can frame, frame, uh, frame a question in either of these. You know, who am I? What do I need? What do we need? What is needed? What is this? You know, so depending on how we frame a question, it might elicit a different experience I want to share with you a couple of really great quotes from Judith to expand on what this experience is like in embodied inquiry. So the first part of this quote, when we know ourselves as fundamental consciousness, all of our responses flow through this ground of our being without getting stuck anywhere. This is absolute receptivity. All of our ideas, all of our fixed attitudes and protective strategies give way to the reception of experience. We can feel an emotion deep in our heart, for example, but we will not hold on to it. The emotion will move through us. Thoughts will flow through our mind, but they will not become obsessive tape loops. We can also allow the vibrations of other human beings to flow through this fundamental dimension of ourselves without being overwhelmed by them. So a few things about this first passage. One is that it, it you know, it's typical in contemplative practice and teachings to frame things in like the Ah, the big, the big experience, the big ideal of what this could be. But to know that really often this is just a matter of capacity, of depth, of continually deepening these experiences. So it may not be like so perfect as described there, but we do get a sense of that through these practices we've been doing in embodiment. We get that sense more and more of feeling receptive, transparent, present and open, that things can flow more. So with embodied inquiry, we're really attuning to that sense of openness that we are transparent and open so that anything could arise. Okay. So that's kind of that part one inhabiting the body and attuning to that receptivity. Another uh, phrase I like to use with this that I find 
uh, you know, um, accurately describes this is disarming ourselves, which is really important, especially when you practice this by yourself. I find, uh, again, if I work with somebody privately, I can guide a person in a way to inhabit, you know, the body where they can lean on my instructions, my guidance, and they can get into a really receptive place and then surprise them with the question, you know? So when we're doing it ourselves, we still have to find our way to where like, okay, how can I let go deeply enough to when I ask a question, something organically can arise in my experience. Um, that's the goal here. So this uh, second part, Judith says, this means that we no longer get in the way of our own responses, our creativity, our pleasure. In this way, embodiment is the basis of spontaneity and freedom. It is an experience of both all pervasive stillness and fluidity, the flow of life at the same time. Even our thoughts can surprise us. Even familiar sights and sounds register with the impact of newness. Now, a few things with this. She mentions uh, creativity and our pleasure, but I want to say any flavor of responses can arise. So this is another way to, to disarm ourselves that it could be parts of us that we're not really fond of. It could be dark thoughts. It can be weird thoughts. It can make no sense. Okay. So this is like everything can come up and I find that that's really interesting and useful. So especially if you're really dropped in, in, in embodied presence and then you ask a question and then just some random image or feeling or thought comes up, ah, that's, it's potent. It's potent. So it doesn't need to be a pleasurable experience or, you know, fireworks or anything like that. Then surprise again, this is really important. I love that she says, even our own thoughts can surprise us. Great. And familiar sights and sounds register with the impact of newness. So it's not necessarily that what arises is surprising. Like, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was there or who I would have never imagined this. But it could be something really familiar in us, but there's something that feels fresh and spontaneous about it. And this manner of arising in our experience with embodied inquiry carries with it, I have found, uh, a strong degree of trust. We trust our own experience. We trust what arises in our experience as being meaningful for us. Even if at first it doesn't make any sense because we're not so concerned if the conceptual mind is analyzing and making some conclusion there's just something there that like, I want to follow this. I want to, I want to ask this question again and again. And if something meaningful did arise, well, yeah, I'll take it off the cushion or, or continue working within various practices. So again, anything can arise, sensations, thoughts, images, feelings, and any flavor, any manner can, can arise in, in response to a question. So I mentioned radical curiosity, but we can also mention radical acceptance. And again, just like we're not trying to intentionally craft radical curiosity aside from doing this, these techniques in, in the way described, um, it's just naturally arising. And so radical acceptance naturally arises. When I mentioned the trust of our response, there's also that acceptance of that response. We accept it when it arises because we're not necessarily deconstructing it immediately and wondering if it's acceptable or not. That response can be radical. And last but not least, as I mentioned before, nothing about this needs to feel perfect. You may have an experience where it feels perfect. That's, a, that's wonderful. Um, but more than anything, like with most practices, do we understand the technique, its purpose, what it can help us with? Great, then we just do it and we follow it up and see where it goes. So that's an overview for embodied inquiry. And now we can jump in and start practicing.